Um, so what I want to do next is I want to um, show you how to make the robot move autonomously, i.e. use computer code to drive the robot. So I'm going to go back into my um, screen share. And what I'm going to do now is I want a new program. So up here at the top right screen is we have a breadcrumb. It's a little navigation menu that lets us move between the main menu and um, the, the, the program. In this case, the robot has a silly name. It's the code. It's called Magical Horse. So here I'll click on My Projects. So here's my program. Again, if I gave it a better name, Magical Horse might be not such a great name. I'm, if I'd called it Move Robot with Controller or something more descriptive, it'll be easy to come back to. To open the program again, I just click on it and everything is back as I left it. Um, the program, the environment automatically saves your code. There's no file saving any of your stuff. So periodically what you'll see is it says auto save active. As we make changes in the code, this will just refresh and save on its own. <clears throat> so you don't have to save your work, it does it for you. Let's create another uh, new program. And I'm gonna come back to the lesson here just to kind of walk us through it. So I'm gonna create a new project. Again, my programming environment is gonna be the robot, the only, my only choice here. This time around, the language is gonna be Blockly. So we're gonna program it rather than using the game controller. And under options, um, I think the lesson calls this program Square Dance. So let's just call it Square Dance and hit create. So again, there's nothing um, happening right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to program the robot. I'm going to turn the robot on. So I'm going to press the check mark button, turn the robot on. I'm going to hit detect sensors. So it found my motors. Again, I could go through that exercise. So I happen to know that this is actually my left motor. And I may want to make this a little bigger so I can read it. This is my right motor. We remember that um, the right motor is upside down. So here again, if I wanted to, I could hit reverse polarity. Now there's actually another way we can do this. Um, and that is we can set up a drive train. And what a drive train does is it allows you to control multiple motors using a single block. So it's kind of like the steering wheel on your car. The way the steering wheel on your car is able to move both of the front two tires, that's what the drivetrain does. So there's two ways we could program the robot. We could program the left motor and then the right motor and then the left motor and then the right motor, and we can make it move. Or we could go to here where it says drivetrain, click on the gear icon. We're gonna configure the drivetrain. It says, do you wanna set this up? Yes, I would like to set it up. It says, give your, what's your left motor, right? The, the, the command needs to know what is it it's controlling. So in this case, the left motor is gonna be motor left. The right motor is going to be motor right. Notice how reverse polarity is already selected for us. We don't need to check it. The computer has figured it out. And the other thing the computer has figured out for us is it no, it, it's assuming we're using the default robot uh, that we built in steps one through 19. And so the wheel travel, which refers to the width of the, of the tires and the track width, which is the distance between the tires in millimeters, um, those two values are known. So we don't need to ever change these numbers. You can imagine if you had a really large robot or a really small robot, the, the width uh, between the two wheels might be different and the wheel size in the VEX world can be larger or smaller than 200 millimeters. I think 200 is actually the smallest wheel size, um, but you may change these numbers. In, your, in this case, for this course, you can just leave these values alone and reverse polarity has already been selected for us. So again, if I was not sure if this was all connected, um, my robot's turned on, I have the cable connected to my Chromebook and I can just hit connect and I can move the sliders around. You can also see when I press on the bumper sensors, how the little yellow, how it's lighting up. So each time I press one of the back bumpers, um, it's detecting that. So here I'll hit disconnect and I have a drivetrain. So let's talk about the blocks that are in here. And I'll make this just a little bit bigger so that we can see it. So uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the blocks are roughly uh, organized by their functionality. So in the robot mesh um, library, blocks related to starting the program's execution are up here. Every blockly program starts with a start block. If you do not have a start block, your program will not run. There will be no way for it to run. So you'll want to go up in here to robot mesh and choose the start button. 
Notice that these are all kind of jigsaw puzzle pieces. And notice that the start block doesn't have a piece before it because nothing can come before the start block. It is always the very first block in your code. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take one to this drive train library because I created a, a block that will allow me to drive both the motors. And here in the drive train library, we can see all the blocks related to movement, right? Driving forward at such a power setting or turning at such a, a angle, a, a turning degree. Um, and then we get different levels of customization and braking. So all of these blocks largely relate to the movement of the robot. So here, what I might say is I'll have the robot drive forward. And for now, we'll just leave the default settings. And then maybe the robot is going to turn left. Again, I can jumble these blocks. If I don't like a block, I can either hit the delete key or I can take it and drop it in the trash can over here. So as long as I have the start block, I'm good. So here we'll put it back. So it's going to drive forwards. Then the robot's going to turn left. And when it's done, um, maybe what will happen is the robot will play a sound. So here under the sound library, we find blocks related to different sound effects the robot can make. So we'll have it go ta-da when it's done running its code. So I like that program. It looks really good, very simple. And what I'll do now is I will press the play button to run the code. Uh, I'm going to go out of the out of the uh, programming environment so you can see how the robot behaves. But all I'm doing uh, in this step is I'm hitting the play button. So um, again, give me a second here. I'm going to end my screen share. And I'm going to run that code. So here's my robot. It's just going to drive forwards and turn. And then it's going to play a sound. So let's see what happens. I hope it works. It's downloading the code right now, so you can't see it. So it's moving. Did you hear the ta-da? Okay. So the cool part about Blockly is that um, it's basically English language. A really fun exercise to do with kids is when trying to solve these problems, just have the have your students talk it out loud. Well, how what they think the robot would do. So in the case of sumo, right? We know that in the sumo game. The robot has to find the ring boundary. If it finds the ring boundary, it needs to not drive over it. So it needs to turn around. Then it's, so you start thinking out loud about what are the steps the robot has to do. And I always find that even if you're at a whiteboard or a chalkboard drawing it out, you very quickly can come up with the, with the English blocks you need uh, to make the robot do what it needs to do. Uh, so here we have different blocks related to the sensors, which I won't get into, but maybe I, this robot happens to have a bumper on it. So let's do this a little bit differently. Maybe if the one of the bumpers is pressed on the back of the robot, the robot will do that behavior. So here under um, sensors, I found is bumper pressed question mark. And then what I'm going to do is under logic, there's an if statement. So we'll say if uh the bumper is pressed and now this little uh exclamation mark is letting you know that we have not selected a bumper sensor so recall that on the right side of my screen i have uh, two bumpers and i have not chosen a bumper so it's letting me know that right now if i try and run this it's not going to work because i haven't configured this block so from the pull down menu i'm going to choose bumper the bumper on port 8 which again maybe that's not such a descriptive name so here what i might have done is i might have called this my left bumper and I have a right bumper. As I change these things, the block auto updates. So now it says, is bumper left pressed? If it does, drive forward, turn, and play ta-da. Now there's a gear icon. What if the bumper is not pressed? What if nothing happens? So here, else, there's a little gear icon I can use to expand the expression. So I take the else block and I close the gear. See how now there's a there's a new a uh, place for me to put stuff if I want to get rid of it. Now it's gone, right? So here I could build very complicated um, decision statements, right? Like if this is true, do this. If this is true, if this is true. And finally, the else down here will execute only as the default condition. So what we'll say in this case is if the bumper is pressed, then it's going to do this behavior. If it's not pressed, it's just going to print a message here to the bottom of the screen. This print block will print text at the bottom. So it will print uh, a message called waiting uh, to be pressed. Right? So nothing's going to happen. And 
because I don't know when the bumper is going to be pressed, it might be pressed right away, it might be pressed in 10 minutes from now, what I'm going to do is in the loops, I'm just going to put a, a loop that repeats these commands forever. So what's going to happen is the blocks are just going to cycle over and over and over again, and this program never ends, it repeats forever. So now I've built this complicated um, uh, code, right? So it's going to do one thing if it's pressed, another if it's not pressed, I'm going to run it. So hit play to run. And I will get out of the screen share so we can see what's happening. So right now the bumper is not pressed. And actually, if we go back to the share screen, so that was my bad to get out of here. See how at the bottom of the screen, it's saying waiting to be pressed, waiting to be pressed, waiting to be pressed, right? So nothing's happening. And in fact, if I wasn't sure about what was happening, this slider up here lets me step through the code. So if I stop this and move this slider down, we'll actually get highlighting. So what's gonna happen is we'll start seeing the code. Um, I think it should be the case, see it's highlighting. So the repeat block is executing. Now it's evaluating and nothing has happened. So we can see it's stepping, right? So this is a good way of showing the logic uh, of the program. And now each time it says waiting to be pressed, it prints it down here at the bottom of the screen. Now um, the robot's not gonna run so great in this really slow mode. So usually I only use that um, slow mode when I'm trying to demonstrate something. So I'm just going to move it back to full speed and let's run it again. So we saw the default behavior. So now it's, it's waiting for something to happen. And now let's press that bumper. So now I have, I left in a right bumper. I pressed it accidentally and it's moving. Right. So now it's waiting again, it's still in that loop. I have a left and a right bumper, which my fat hands are in the way of. So this is my left, your right. So this is left, this is right. So I'm gonna press the left bumper and now it's moving. Okay. As the last uh, bit here, some of you who may or may not be interested in teaching Python, I have no idea how interesting that is to people but I had mentioned how we could see the generated code. Notice here, uh, if I stop the program, so now it's not running anymore, there's a generated code tab. It's actually showing me the real programming code that's being created from those blocks, right? So there may be some of your more advanced students that are really curious about how does a real programming language work? Well, what you can see is that as you add blocks, and if you wanna be really uh, crafty, there's a little arrow here that's an anchor. I can click on it to have a side-by-side -side split screen. And I'm just gonna add a block up here, uh, a comment. And so I'm adding the comment. I'm gonna write that uh, robots are awesome. And you can see that I wrote that, robots are awesome, right? If I add another block here like logic if, so now it's adding something else, right? So if some logical condition is true, whatever, um, it starts building that expression. So not everyone will be interested in it, but that is um, just a, 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 this is potentially a bridge um, to more advanced programming. Clicking on the little arrow up here again either lets me uh, dock the screen, or if I if I need more screen space, I just click it again, and I can again adjust these screens accordingly. Uh, for the amount of screen space I need. The very last thing in here that I will get to and then I'll stop talking so we can I can breathe and get oxygen and let you ask questions. Um, is there's a description tab. So the idea of this description tab is it's kind of like a notebook within a project file. I can type whatever I want here. I can insert YouTube videos. Uh, so maybe you want to put uh, like a YouTube video or something in here. There is a way to do that. It just escapes me right now. Um, and you can use this as like a notebook to kind of explain your thought process or describe what you're having. When I do lessons with kids, if I'm going to do my own lessons, sometimes I'll just write stuff in here as, as kind of a set of instructions for them and then just let them solve the coding. Again, all of this stuff, which I went through very quickly, lives. So I'm just going to show you it at, at a, in a completed lesson. So here it's showing you step by step if we start here. So this is the drivetrain exercise we just did. So it's going to tell you the materials you need. Like the, it gives you usually a rough duration, 45 to 60 minutes. There's a discussion piece, right? What do you think of how does a car move? Um, tells you how to set that up. So here's the pictures of them clicking on the little drivetrain icon and going on that. A sample code for them to uh, work on. 
And then there's a challenge here called Square Dance Challenge. And so again, the kids will figure out how to build that code. And if they want to look at a finished example, uh, then they can just go here into the app, come back up here to my projects, and there'll be a code here called Square Dance. And this is the finished code. I cannot delete or change any of this, right? It's all read only. The only thing worth mentioning is that you can see that I can't change the mapping of sensors. So it's assuming that you've built the robot as per the instructions with the, the motors and, and sensors mapped to the correct ports. But here now I have a working solution and I can either download it to my robot and then unplug the robot and drive it on the floor. Or if I want it to run in my hand, the way I just showed you, I can hit run, hit play, and it will just magically work. Um, so that's the course in a nutshell. All of these lessons eventually build up to a robot sumo challenge. Uh, so there's like a sumo version one and two. I can't remember which is which, but I'll just open up one of these to see what the finished code looks like. So now this is quite a little more complicated, right? We have loops. We have a distance sensor that's checking for an opponent that's so many, I think, centimeters away. We have a color sensor that's doing a comparison to see if it's detected the ring boundary. Um, and then there's different behaviors that happen as a result, right? And so that's actually the code they will run. And there's comments here explaining what the code is doing. So looking for opposing robot, waiting for opponent to be detected, drive around without leaving ring, try to move the opponent out of the ring. And when it does that, drive as fast and as hard as it can to, to push it. Um, so that is our um, Sumo Course uh, 101. And we'll just hang out here for questions because that was a lot of information to be unfortunately dumped on you in a very short Zoom meeting. So I apologize for that. Uh, any questions? Have fun. It's a kid's toy. It's supposed to be fun. If you're really depressed and angry or anxious about this, then you're doing it wrong. Um, I, 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 like I said, it's, 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 it's quite entertaining to me now because I don't have to know anything. I just have to show people where to look. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. The kids are going to love it. And I will uh, add as a footnote. So although we did, we, we, we're not talking about competition, VEX itself has a, uh, a, a global competition. So we've invented this sumo game for you guys to have an activity to drive to. But VEX IQ has, um, has, a, has state competitions, national competitions, and an international competition with brackets, right? You win your state championship to go to the national championship. But the programming language that I've shown you is tournament legal. So if you're like, wow, I want to do more of this forever and ever, and I want to get involved in the VEX competition, uh, you now know how to program it and you know how to build a robot and you're very well suited to, to go further with it if you want to go further with it. Awesome. Well, Chris, I will say that you did a wonderful job because I had a chance to dive into the virtual studio app before this training. And I feel that now with your instruction, I'm like, now that makes sense because I understand now. So thank you so much. This was great. Yeah, anytime. Like I said, the if, if you if you got a good handle on the robot, the environment's pretty simple, right? The blocks use English commands. They're sorted by their functionality. On the right-hand side is showing you the physical setup of your robot, right? So again, usually when you have problems running your code, it's related to there being a mismatch with the ports. So I've told you to plug the motor into port six and you put it into seven. It's fine. You can use port seven, but then you got to change that setup menu on the side so that the robot knows so the programming language knows to use the right ports with motors again very common uh for the for the uh axle to be out of the motor and lastly uh if the controller is ever not paired i showed you that you use the cable to make it talk and beyond that if you have a charged battery you should be able to have a good time always charge your battery get into the habit of the last thing you do before you walk out for the day is everything should be charging um and then enjoy it. It is. It, 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 I had. I, I. I'm not an educator by vocation. Um, I'm a pretty bad computer programmer by vocation, and I was stumbled into this much like yourself. Somebody volunteered me to be a good role model to youth to teach about STEM and all the good jobs there are in STEM, and I hated that person for many years. <laughs> uh, and so I was very nervous because I was like, oh, how do I manage the classroom? How do I prepare? But um, a lot of those lessons about classroom management, which you have as professional educators, they're reiterated inside that document. 
and I think the lessons are quite sensibly uh, paced. And so uh, that book is really the culmination of like 10 years of me getting it wrong and working very well with Trillium Publishing in Seattle, who did a fantastic job of combing through that book uh, to make sure that all the code works and, and it's completely perfect. So I, I, I sleep very well at night knowing that book exists and you should too. I think the feature that's gonna help me sleep the most at night is the true to size poster where you can match the parts. Yeah, that absolutely. is the essential piece. And it, it's that. important to tell everyone that. So I, like I said, I taped that poster to the front of the class. When I did the training in Camden with Shirley and Nicole and a couple of others, we, when I was building the robot, I said, well, it, it's like Ikea instructions, right? It shows you a picture, take, make a guess and walk up to the poster and see if it fits. And if it's, if it fits, you got the right piece. If you, it is possible that kids will lose parts, right? There's a lot of little pieces in there. It does happen. If you don't have the exact right piece, but you have one that's a little bigger, a little smaller, it will probably still work. Um, it, you know, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. it. It is another kind of useful thing is at the end of the day, as part of our wrapping up, as kids put their robots on their box with their charger and it's plugged in, I tell everyone to stand up and take a look under their desk, under their chair. The little parts or pieces wind up under the floor. Very, very common. Some very, very small pieces in there, like these little Lego type pegs. Like, see, my fat hands are like covering it right? Like you're going to totally lose that, right? So I, you know, before we, we finish up for the day, everybody take a look at your friend's desk, take a look at your desk, friend checks your desk, look under the table, under the chair, no loose pieces that the vacuum is going to find, got your box, put it over there, charge it up, let's go home for the day, we'll come back to it tomorrow and you're ready for a new day. Um, other questions, comments? I didn't put anyone to sleep. Like all of you are still on camera and you're conscious, which is like really cool. I would have been off camera dozing, but uh, uh, any other comments, concerns, jokes, criticisms, harsh criticisms? Thank you very much. Yeah. I was looking for those videos from Hawaii and I couldn't find them for you guys. But like we know from when this ran in person, like kids ran with it, they had a great time, adults were nervous everything was awesome. So I think you know, just keep like cheerleader teachers a lot, but this is going to be really fun. It is. Yeah. It's there. It, this is designed to be like, uh, like robotics in a box for complete dummies. Um, and I was the first dummy to do it. Um, and like, I, I, you're going to be, you're going to be laughing. And actually it's really cool is you'll become once you do it, other teachers around you and people will say, hey, you know what, like you didn't lose your mind doing this. This isn't so bad. I would like to try it myself. And uh, unfortunately, you'll become like the robot expert in your school or in your community. And people will start talking you into hosting lessons for Catapult. And like, see, like I had this whole other life where I was like a real computer programmer. And now I'm teaching teachers, which is really scary for me because I'm the last person to know anything about teaching. But such is life. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments before we break? And Vicky yep. said, just make sure to make, to have your students check their pockets after each session. Cause yes, these pieces will walk out and sometimes not intentionally just, you know. It just happens. I, I, I'm like a zealot about make, getting on my hands and knees and crawling behind students to make sure, and then getting them to crawl behind me to make sure. And you know, they do get lost. We do have a refurbishment team. They will do their best to ensure that the kit you get, which was used previously is, has everything it needs. But you'll be doing a great service um, to both the guy in Seattle who's refurbishing the kits and to your fellow teachers using the kit after you if you can do the best to keep the box as intact as possible. Because we there's a bit of a turnaround, right? So if the boxes come back in good shape, they get flipped quickly. Some folks like uh, I think Sarah in Hawaii, there's a bit of a lead time with getting stuff to Hawaii. It just it's really awful. It has to get on like a container ship and leave from San Francisco on a journey and I was like, wow, what a pain it is getting robot kits to Hawaii, but it does happen. And so it helps us flip the kits more quickly if, if, and if they're all intact. 